Please have a seat. Uh, the title of this new series is What Really Matters? And it's a brand new year. And because it's a new year, I thought I would do something different. Next week, I'll be turning 59. And I thought at this stage in life, yeah, it's time for the comb over. So I'm going to grow my hair out and comb it over. Try something new, you know? It'll work for a little while. I got plenty of hair on the sides. I'll just flip it over on the top. Not a problem at all. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about the preacher. The theme of this book is not difficult to see. It's very clear because he announces it in verse 2. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. He closes the book, chapter 12, verse 8. Vanity, vanity. And it's not only at the beginning and the end, it's echoed throughout the entire letter. The author, otherwise known as the preacher or the teacher, depending on your translation, declared that everything was, again, meaningless or vanity, Everything, meaningless or vanity, depending on your translation. The word for vanity or meaningless is the Hebrew word havel. And it's been translated in our English language as meaningless or vanity, but it really doesn't capture the heart of the idea. The word havel literally means vapor or smoke. Like James, when he says, your life is but a vapor that appears for a little while, then it's gone. It's like you see it and then you don't. The preacher uses this word havel 38 times in the book as a metaphor to describe how life is, first of all, temporary. It's fleeting. Like a wisp of smoke. It's here and then it's gone. Secondly, how life is an enigma or a paradox. Like smoke, it appears solid, but when you try to grab onto it, there's nothing there. And that's life. In so many ways, life is so beautiful. The world is beautiful, and as you're enjoying it, everything is great, and then tragedy strikes, and it all seems to blow away, like all of us. We all have a strong sense of justice. We want right and wrong, but as we look through the world, there are people that are good, moral people that are kind, that are gracious, and yet experience bad things all the time because life is unpredictable. The one constant in life is that it's incon inconsistent, that it's not constant, that it's constantly unpredictable, unstable. It's like the words of the preacher in this book. It's chasing after the wind. It's Havel. It's meaningless. It's vanity. The real question is, why is he saying all this? The author, I believe, has a basic goal in mind, a desire. His target is to teach us all the ways that we try to build meaning and purpose into our lives apart from God. We're constantly seeking for meaning and purpose apart from God. And you can't find it. It's meaningless. It's vanity. So the preacher is basically deconstructing all the ways that we invest our energy and our emotions in the things that ultimately have no lasting meaning or satisfaction. We're constantly pouring our lives out for things that don't matter. This book is basically a hard lesson in reality, and it's going to be good for us. 
as we study this book. But more than that, it's the solution to life's reality and helps us to answer the question, what really matters, which is the title of this series. What really matters? And how we can have a God-centered worldview instead of a self-centered worldview. Ecclesiastes is from a Greek word, ecclesiastes, meaning one who calls or gathers the ecclesia, the church. The Hebrew word is kole, and it means to herald, to proclaim, to preach. The author or preacher is writing from his personal experiences. So the question is, well, who's the author? Who's literally writing this book? And there's lots of debates and discussions among scholars, but fortunately for us, he lets us know in the very first verse. Ecclesiastes 1.1 says, the word of the preacher the son of David, king in Jerusalem. There was only one son who ruled as king in Jerusalem, and his name was Solomon. Solomon was inspired by the Lord to write this. And this is him preaching, proclaiming a message from his own life experiences. This was not the only book that he wrote in the Old Testament. He wrote Proverbs, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. Most scholars believe that he wrote Proverbs while he was young and walking with God and filled with wisdom. And then they believe he wrote Song of Solomon's in the middle of his life as he was older and passionate for women. And then at the end of his life, he wrote Ecclesiastes. When you look at how Ecclesiastes unfolds, you'll notice that this is basically a guy who's looking at his life in a rearview mirror. He's looking back. Personally, I believe after reading this over and over and looking at 1 Kings, I believe that he was writing from a life of regret. I really do. And I think he's looking at his life and his experiences and all the various aspects of his life. And he's looking at life in hindsight. Like, I wish I could do it over. I wish I could have a mulligan. I wish I could have a second chance. And he writes Ecclesiastes saying, I've been there and done that. And I even bought the t-shirt. And I came away empty. I came away empty. I lived my life to the fullest. I denied myself no pleasure. And when it was all said and done, I still had nothing. It was still meaningless. It was still all vanity. And this is the diary of so, so many people that we walk next to, that we work with, that are in our families. So, so many people. People who've, who live their lives to the fullest. They've built great businesses. They've had great careers. They've accumulated more wealth than a person could spend in three lifetimes. And they get to some point in their life and they realize, I've done all this. I've accomplished all that. I've experienced so much. Why do I feel so empty? Why is it so void? And you might be thinking, yeah, that's probably true for a lot of people. That's probably true for most people but not for Solomon. I mean, how can that be true for Solomon? I mean, he was the king of Israel. 
of all the people, why would he write something like this? He knew God and God knew him. He spoke to God and God spoke to him. Well, there, there is a background story that I will get to in a few minutes because I don't think that we can truly understand or appreciate the book of Ecclesiastes until we first understand some of Solomon's history, some of the events that unfolded in his life. But before we go there, I want you to know that there are two general ways of interpreting the book of Ecclesiastes. Two lenses that we can view this book from. First view. The first view would be that Solomon is writing this book venting. I mean, he's just venting about his disappointment and his, his outcome of life. He's disappointed with his life, and he's disappointed with God in the process. He's completely venting about how life has been random and unpredictable and disappointing and frustrating. Even though he had accomplished all these things, like building the greatest temple for God, accomplished more wealth than any man who had ever lived. So successful, but still so frustrated. He was frustrated at the way his life turned out. So some think you should read this book thinking that he is just venting, that he's just venting about the way his life ended up because he walked away from the Lord and at the end of his life, he was just miserable. And that is a view that many biblical scholars hold to. They believe that you should read this book that way. I don't. The second view. It's a view that I presently hold to doesn't mean that you have to hold to it, but I believe that he's not venting, but warning. He's not venting, he is warning anyone and everyone who will listen. He's trying to herald, he's trying to preach to anyone who would hear him. Learn from my life, learn from my mistakes and all the bad choices that I made. Learn from me because it didn't go well for me. It didn't end up good in spite of the fact that I had so many successes and I was so wealthy. I mean, I had a lot of money and I had a lot of women and I had a lot of everything. I denied myself nothing. I did it all. I've been there and done that. And yet I was empty. It was vanity. It was meaningless. And I don't want you to end up like me. I don't want you to waste your life trying to fill your life with all these meaningless things that count for nothing. Don't go down that path. Don't follow in my footsteps. Learn from my mistakes. And then he summarizes it all at the end of the book. But he expresses all this other stuff first for 12 chapters. And at the very end, he gives the answer. What really matters? But first, to help us understand what really matters, we have to see the vanity, the meaningless, and all these other attempts that we experience. You see, Solomon didn't have a question, was there a God? 
In no way was he an agnostic or an atheist. He had a relationship with God. He knew God. The real question was, does God matter? Does it matter if you know God? Does it really matter? And that's what a whole lot of people are wondering in our world. I mean, they look at us as Christians and they say, well, you have God, but you still have trials and you still have issues and you still have outbursts of anger and you still sin and you have God. Does it really matter? Does it change anything? I mean, either way, life is unpredictable. There are things that happen and a lot of those things are not very good. They definitely don't make you happy, even for those who are trying to live their best life now, right? They're trying to live their best life now, but things still go array. Things still fall apart. Even for Christ followers who are seeking to bring glory and honor to God, things unravel. Life has twists and turns Marriages fall apart. Relationships end over conflict. People get sick and die. Tragedy strikes us all, whether you know Christ or don't. Does it really matter that we follow God? That's the question. It's a very thought-provoking book because he lays out how he's lived his life and all the frustrations he felt and experienced. It's raw and it's real and it's going to be a great book for us. And let me say, it does matter because living life apart from God means no peace, no joy, no love. It's empty. It's vanity. It's meaningless. There is no purpose apart from God. And that's the message that we need to be proclaiming to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our family members, to our friends. We've got to share that truth. God's not going to paint it in the sky. He has called you and I to preach just like Solomon is now the preacher. He is the preacher preaching to anyone who will listen. So in order to understand this book, we have to look at some of the facts and events and history of Solomon's life. So I want to start in 1 Kings. So today is just an introduction to lay out uh, the preacher, who this is, and why he's giving us this message. And we're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 2, if you have your Bible with you. 1 Kings chapter 2, we're going to begin with verses 1 through 3. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Now, I find it interesting that he says to his son, show yourself a man. I mean, in one aspect, he's talking about following the commands of God. We all need that. But why would he say to him, show yourself a man? Do you know how old Solomon was in 900 B.C.? Well, most scholars think he might have been 15 or 16. But according to Josephus, who was a historian, he said he was 14 years old. 14 years old, about to lead a nation, 
about to become the king of two to three million people. No small task. So he says, show yourself a man. Now, remember, when we read a narrative, it's not like we think moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. So we're going to drop to verse 10. And this could have been weeks, months, or literally years between David telling him that he was about to die and him dying. Most scholars believe at least eight months to a year and a half. So verse 10, the Bible says, then David slept with his father. So maybe he's 15 or 16 by now. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and then 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David. He became the king. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. This is a very young man put in a very big position. He is now king of Israel. When you get to chapter 3, time has passed, and immediately the Bible tells us that Solomon loved the Lord, and the Lord loved Solomon. He is growing in this relationship. So because God loves him, verse 5, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. Basically, God is saying, hey, ask me for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. I love you that much. You can ask for anything, and I will give it to you. Because you love me, and I love you. Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father. Because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. Did he ask for anything? No. He is praising God for his goodness, not to him, but to his father. Completely selfless. And this is a very young man. He's not self-centered. He's not selfish. He's not seeking for himself. He is praising God. Now, think about when you pray. When you go to prayer, God, I, I need more money. God, I need a job. God, I need you to fix my wife. God, I need you to straighten out my husband. God, help this person. God, do this for me. God, I need a new car. Give me, give me, give me. That's often how we pray as American Christians. But when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray, what did he say? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are to exalt him. First thing, we should be praising him and thanking him and loving him and adoring him and lifting him up instead of asking and asking and asking like God is some big vending machine in the sky. You put your time in and cha-ching, you get whatever you want. It doesn't work that way. God wants us to come to him in humility and acknowledge who, because that's all it is. It's a simple acknowledgement of who God is. He is awesome. He is holy. He is righteous. He is good. No one else is. So that's how Solomon approaches God, the way that we should all approach God. 
the conversation continues. And now God, and now our Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. Talking about humility. This is humility. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. He's like, I can't leave. The, it's so big. It's so great. God, you've put me in this position because of my father. And I am grateful. But I need help. Verse 9, he asked for it. He says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind. He's asking for wisdom to govern your people, not for his own benefit, not for his own welfare, to govern who? your people. This is for you, God, to govern your people and for them that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. Why did that please God? Because it was selfless. Because it was surrendered. It was in humility. It was this is what's best for you and the kingdom. Not what's best for me, but what's best for your work right here in this world. And it pleased God. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies. That means to kill his enemies. But you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I'm going to make you a one and only. Nobody will ever be or has ever been as wise as you will be. Because he asked for wisdom in humility. After praising and thanking God for all that he has done for his father and then for himself. He came to God in complete humility. He was surrendered. And because of that, years later, we see, as this is all unfolding, chapter 4, verse 29 and 30, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure. Beyond measure means that it is immeasurable. You can't calculate it. We can calculate the distance to the moon, but we can't calculate the wisdom of Solomon beyond measure and breadth of mind, like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. Verse 32 says, he also spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts, of the birds and of reptiles and of fish and people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. People traveled for days and weeks and months to sit at the feet 
of Solomon. Why? Because Solomon loved God and God loved Solomon. He loved God and God loved him. And from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. What happened? What happened to Solomon? How did he go from being the wisest man in the world to the dumbest man in the world? It started with not trusting God. Everything hinges on faith. Old Testament and new. You say, what do you mean he didn't trust God? Well, we go to chapter 11. And the Bible says in chapter 11, now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonon, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. It didn't start that way. It started politically. He had 700 wives. How is that the wisest man? You can't please one wife. How are you going to please 700? And then he had 300 girlfriends. I mean, there's not a man in here that can emotionally meet every need of his wife. You just can't do it. Not 100%. So why would you think... He wasn't doing it to meet their need. He was doing it for political reasons so that he wouldn't be at war, so that he would be in relationship with all these nations because he wasn't trusting God. He found a way. God gave him this great gift, and how many of you know that God will give you a gift and you can squander it, you can waste it, you can throw it away, and that's exactly what he did. God gave him a talent, a gift, a blessing, and he wasted it. He squandered it. He no longer used it. He fell from the grace of God. He was slipping. He was moving further and further away from God. And how does that start? It starts with one choice. If I marry this woman... And it started with Pharaoh's daughter. That's where it started. If I marry Pharaoh's daughter, then I'll have an alliance with Egypt. They won't attack me. I'll put them at bay. I can deal with them financially. I can deal with them in trade. And we won't have to worry about war. It went from one to two to three, to four, to 700. It's like the illustration I told you years ago, right? It's like you go to the beach with your family and you get on a raft and you just put it out like three feet and then you just shut your eyes. And 20 minutes later, you open your eyes and you look up and you're like, where's my family? Where did everybody go? Well, they didn't move. They didn't move. God never moved. You drifted, and you drifted, and you drifted. And that's exactly what happened with Solomon. He drifted, and he drifted, and he drifted. And the further you get away from God, the harder it is to hear God. All the wind, and all the noise, and all the distractions keep you from hearing the voice of God. And it only starts with one sin. Feelings, fear instead of faith. 
He stopped living in faith and trusting that God would provide, and he handled his own means. He made a good decision rationally. But everything that seems rational doesn't mean that it's always spiritual. Just because it seems like the best thing to do or the right thing to you doesn't mean it's what God wants you to do. Every decision should be made through prayer. It's not about just making rational decisions that seem best for you and your family. And I know at times we feel like that's the best way to operate. Now, making a rational decision if you are in the Spirit of God and you're abiding in Christ is good because you're already in his presence. But if you're not in the presence of Christ and you're not abiding in him, then making a rational decision is only your flesh. It's only you taking care of you. And to be honest with you, most of the time we're all in our flesh. And so we need to stop and pray before we decide and ask for God to lead us and guide us and give us wisdom so that we stay close to him. So that we don't drift away. Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 2 talks about drifting away. And that's exactly what happened to Solomon. Verse 3 says he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. So, First, he does this politically. Second, now he's walking in disobedience because as we saw in the last verse, God had commanded that you should not marry. Now look, there's nothing wrong with interracial marriages. Nothing. But there is something completely wrong with a Christ follower marrying an unsafe person. They're different. One's in the light, one's in the dark. A believer cannot coexist with an unbeliever. We have different values, different purposes, different meaning in life. And the Israelites were God's chosen people. They were not to coexist, especially to marry someone from a foreign, because that comes with other gods. Then there's the influence of the other gods coming into your camp for not only you, but for everybody else around you, because sin is contagious. Right? When you sin, it affects everybody. The drunk driver who has too many beers and crosses the yellow line not only kills himself, but the family of five or six. He takes them all out. So your sin just doesn't hurt you. It hurts the people around you. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. There was also, obviously, a sexual issue that he was struggling with if he had 300 concubines. Those are his mistresses, his girlfriends on the side. 300. And his wives, pay attention to this, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. David drifted, but then he repented. And he came right back. Solomon stayed in this state for years. And I believe at the end of his life, which is why we're reading the book of Ecclesiastes, he does come back and he does repent and he does lay out the full summation of what life is really about, what really matters. But in this period of his time, he was in the dark. Look, this is somebody that knew God. Heard from God. Anybody here hearing God audibly? I hope not. He heard from God. He 
and yet he had drifted so far away. So if that's possible for him, how possible is it for you? Look, you got to be on guard. You, you always have to be prepared. You always have to take your thoughts captive because all it takes is one slip and then another one and then another one and then another one. And they, they just keep building up. It's like telling a lie. You tell one lie and then you got to cover that lie and then you got to cover those lies. And then before you know it, you don't even remember what lie you told because you're so deep in it. Not only were these women his wives, but these women's brought other gods with them. He shouldn't have married them in the first place, but they brought their gods, and eventually he turned to their gods. And it gets even worse. Verse 5 says, For Solomon went after Astaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So it went from being disobedient to defying to doing what is evil. Do you see the transgression? Do you see the slope? Disobedient, defying, evil. And Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord. As, did, as David, his father, had done. Do you think he woke up one day and said, you know what? The heck with God. I'm just done with him. Things didn't go my way. He had everything. He had the kingdom. It wasn't because he woke up and said, I'm done with that. It was because he slipped and slipped, and it's a slippery slope. And you've got to understand that. That's why I'm warning you. I think that's why he is warning us in the book of Ecclesiastes. All the things that we are feeling our life, filling our lives up for meaning and purpose apart from God are empty. They're void. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And to top that, then Solomon built a high place a temple, a place of worship. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. And on the mountain east of, where did he build it? East of Jerusalem. The temple of God that he had built for God, and then across from the temple of God is the temple of the devil. He built the temple for Satan after he had built the temple of God. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. Do you know what they sacrificed? That's right. Children. He went from evil to despicable. Murder of innocent children. It doesn't get any worse than that. How do you go from loving God and being loved by God to being despicable before God? to the point where you're building temples so they can sacrifice babies. Nobody plans on that. It's a slippery slope. And that's why sin is serious. And that's why abiding is critical. Staying close to Jesus. Really connected talking to him and hearing from him and communicating with him and loving him and praising him and knowing him and growing in your knowledge and understanding of who he is and what he's doing. I believe at the end of his life, and many scholars don't believe, they think he was just venting that he died and went to hell because he was 
so wretched. But I don't think that. You, you can. And I, I don't know. I don't know. But I hope that he truly repented and truly wrote this book of Ecclesiastes so that we could understand what really matters. Because he had experienced it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And his summation of all of it is vanity, vanity. All is vanity, meaningless. And he sums it up for us at the very end of the book. What really matters. And for us as Christ followers, what matters is that we know the truth and that we are proclaiming the truth, that we are living the truth, that we are walking in the truth and that God is using us for his glory. I'm excited about the book. I'm sorry, it's just the introduction today. If you really want to read over this week, we're going to go from verses 2 through 12. So just read over that, read over that, read over that, then continue and read through the whole book. Take this in. If you're doing the fast with me, then stay up. Today you're on John chapter 8. You should be at John 8, and I'm giving you a verse to meditate on. Write it down. Carry it with you. Think about how do you live this out? How do you abide in the word? So that the word is living through you. Lord, we come to you. Father, in humility. Because you alone, God, are good. You alone are righteous. You alone are holy. God, you're perfect in every way. And we are everything but perfect. So we're so grateful for the goodness and the mercy and the grace that you have poured out on each of our lives, that you have saved us and reconciled us and redeemed us from our sin, keeping us from your wrath. God, in humility, we ask for Mahdi, Father, first that you would bring comfort to her, you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. So I know that you will care for her. But let us be your feet and your hands. God, use us to love her and to encourage her, to comfort her. Father, give her the peace that passes all understanding as she rests in you. Encourage her, Father. Strengthen her for the journey that she is about to take. And Father, I want to lift up mercy and Trinity and just ask God that you would protect them emotionally. God, that you would, that you would guard their hearts and their minds, that you would love them right where they are, Father, so that they know that they are loved and not abandoned or not rejected or not forsaken. God, that they would know that you love them. Help them, Father, to see your goodness in the midst of this pain. And I pray, God, that you would raise them up to be witnesses and testimonies for your glory. That they would proclaim your name before the world, Father. I want to lift up Lily, God, who's got the most beautiful smile, such a sweet spirited girl. God, I just pray that you would give her peace. I know this transition will be difficult for her. She's lost her family and she's at a loss again. And there's nothing that we can do except trust you. It's in your hands, Lord. So we're praying that you would provide a great family, a family who will love her and encourage her 
and minister to her, Father. And I'm asking that you would also just give her peace during these difficult days. And my heart goes out to Elijah, Father, who has only known Madi and Luther as mom and dad. God, I pray that you would walk him through this, Father, step by step, that you would be with him, that you would hold him, that you would carry him, Father, and that the peace that passes all understanding would protect him, Lord. Give him the grace that he needs to go through this transition, Father, this trial, this change in his life for his good, Lord. Use it for his good. And ultimately, God, we want you to be glorified through this tragedy. Only you can providentially work this out for your glory. And I know you will. Because you're faithful. Even when we're faithless. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this body that you have called us to. The ecclesia, the called out ones. We are yours. And we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.